hosting us, and to Domingo for those very kind and perhaps not quite justified remarks, but also for his support uh, as director of the EEA uh, when I was working there on, on volume one. Uh, it must be said that in early times like those, uh, the Commission was not so keen on seeing a report from the agency on the precautionary principle. It was seen as not our role to do these interesting reports, shall we say. Um, and Domingo was quite clear about his independence from the Commission and wanted to produce that sort of book. And it was because it became used quite a lot by a lot of people that during the 2000s uh, we were asked to consider doing volume two. And volume two is a little bit bigger than volume one. Um, but it too tries to look at the growth of knowledge from nothing to a lot in many cases and to see what society did with that knowledge in trying to continue with innovations but to minimize the harm from innovations um, and that's the essence uh, of the book. So what I will do is briefly describe something about the precautionary principle from the beginning and I know there'll be different layers of knowledge here um, and then illustrate with just a few examples from uh, both volumes um, how the precautionary principle has been used a few times but normally ignored by most societies including the EU. Um, it begins with the PP in the treaty uh, which is the overarching treaty that governs the EU, where it quite clearly says that the environmental policies should be based upon the precautionary principle, as well as uh, two other principles, in particular the polluter pays principle. Unfortunately, there's no definition of the PP in the treaty, uh, so we have to turn to other uh, places. But before we look at the definition, I thought it would be interesting just to locate the origins of the idea, which were in Germany in the late 70s, early 80s, when they were confronted by the destruction or the damage to their famous black forests, a key asset, and where the causes of that were not terribly clear. But air pollution seemed to be playing a role in that. But because there was a lot of scientific uncertainty, uh, the German de decision makers thought we need to have a legal um, mandate, a legal justification for taking action when the knowledge is not yet certain, when there is a lot of uncertainty. And so they invented the Vorsorge Prinzip, badly pronounced, as a principle of administrative and legal action. In, where there is a need to act in the case of some considerable uncertainty, but where perhaps the dangers of not acting seem to be much greater than the dangers of um, acting. And from there, it spread into the marine environment where politicians and decision makers and scientists saw that the complex mess of many chemicals going into the sea were likely to cause problems, but it was very unclear as to how that would happen and to where the certainties lay, but the substances kept pouring into the North Sea. So the North Sea too came up with um, a definition that said, let's not wait for the damage let's just lower the environmental burden of hazardous chemicals going into the sea. This seems an intelligent idea. And they justified that with the precautionary principle. And then it spread to a lot of other key documents, including in particular the Rio Declaration of 1992. And there that you can see there was a definition, uh, but it's not so useful, uh, many people think, in that it clearly establishes a lack of full scientific uncertainty, and it says that absence of scientific uncertainty shall not be used to postpone action, which is like a triple negative. Not so, it's put the wrong way around, we felt. And it's not surprising that given that definition and many other 
slightly different ones, there is sometimes confusion as to what the basic ideas are with the PP. So during the discussions after volume one, the agency came up with uh, a working definition which helps to clarify what it is in order for people to discuss it in the same terms. And so it's focusing on a situation of complexity and uncertainty and ignorance. We, we, we said in volume one that many scientists are not so enthusiastic about accepting areas of ignorance. They like uncertainty about something, but not knowing what's out there uh, when you appreciate that there is something out there is something they're not so keen uh, to, under, uh, to, to, to acknowledge. Perhaps I should explain that a bit more clearly. With CFCs, the gases that produced a hole in the ozone layer, in 1973 and before, no human had a thought about these chemicals, widely used, floating up 25 kilometers and making a hole in the ozone layer. It was not even dreamt of at that time. When the paper was written in 1975 by two chemists who said, these molecules will go up there and they will transform themselves through atmospheric chemistry and make a hole in the ozone layer. Now, that paper was very solid. It later got a Nobel Prize for chemistry, and it was in 1975. But after that, everybody realized that there was the possibility of this, and there was uncertainty about it still, but it moved from the realm of ignorance into the realm of uncertainty. So this is the context for using the PP, and where there are threats of potentially serious or irreversible harm, then there should be action in order to prevent that harm using a sufficient amount of evidence. And that sufficient amount of evidence depends on the cases. It's not saying one level of evidence or another. And it depends, as the last line illustrates, on the pros and the cons, so far as we can think about them, of action or inaction. The cent one central feature then is how much evidence do we wait for? And many, many years ago, in the middle of the tobacco uh, controversy in 1965, a beautiful paper was written which focused on this at the end. The paper was called Environment and Disease Association or Causation by Bradford Hill. And towards the end of the paper, he says the case for action. When should scientists get together with politicians and decide we have sufficient evidence? And he gave these examples saying, if we have a pill being given to 10 million women and there's just slight evidence that it could cause damage to the unborn child, then we ban the pill. If, we t if it turns out to be a mistake, the cost is not so bad. But if we don't ban the pill, then we can have another thalidomide tragedy or a DES tragedy, which is described in volume two, where women have taken these pills leading to gross birth defects in their offspring. He said in another situation in a factory using a probable possible carcinogen, where there's a lot of benefits from using that substance at that time, um, from jobs and uh, profits and uh, customers' satisfaction, then maybe we wait for a middle level of evidence before taking action. And then he said, if you want the government to interfere with people's private activity like smoking or eating fatty foods or using uh, coal in the grate, he said, foreseeing climate change, then you would want to go for a, quite a high level of evidence. And then the last two examples from the bottom there illustrate this again from law, where normally we use beyond all reasonable doubt a high level of proof, a high strength of evidence, in the criminal courts, realizing that it is a bad thing to put somebody in jail for a murder if they didn't do it. So we wait for a, a, a high level of evidence for that. Whereas in another court, where you have perhaps a widow who has lost her husband through um, a work accident, asking for compensation for her and her children, uh, courts generally use a lower level, balance of probabilities. These are there to illustrate that um, 
this question of strength of evidence is a, an ethical and political choice. It's not a scientific question. We should collectively decide how much evidence do we want to wait for before we take action. In gathering that evidence about when is a good time to take action or not, we decided to follow up volume one with volume two, and together they are covering 34 case studies, uh, many chemicals that you see, some to do with ecosystems, uh, animal feed additives and asbestos, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, radiations, and what we call micro technologies and transport fuel additives. And in each case, we look at the history of knowledge and the history of action or inaction. There are eight horizontal chapters also that syn synthesize the knowledge from the case studies and turn them into insights uh, about things such as the PP, a chapter in volume two, or precautionary science, or a whole chapter on what Domingo mentioned, false positives. Um, the opposition to the PP often say, you will do a false positive if you use the PP. In other words, you'll try and restrict something that is not really hazardous. And we looked at that uh, at 88 separate case studies in that one chapter to see if it were true that societies anywhere in Europe and America had acted too early. And most of them, 84 of them, uh, it was not the case. There were just four examples from which we could also learn. So the question is, was the PP used in all of these 34 case studies? It was in a few and I highlight them here. Uh, France uh, is perhaps the lead country in, in, in using it uh, in the case studies that we looked at. TBT was a paint, I'll not spend much time on that. Um, but gaucho is a, a pesticide used in the um, fields of maize and sunflowers, which uh, seemed in the early 90s in France in particular to be damaging the bees. The beekeepers noticed that the bees were being damaged a year after this new pesticide was introduced into the fields. And so they began a campa campaign of gathering evidence and lobbying the government and using the courts to try and get action. The government uh, set up um, um, several committees uh, to look at this. Uh, and. Um, in, two, in 1999, they decided to ban uh, uh, gaucho on the um, sunflower and then later on the maize. Uh, this ban has been taken up by the EU in 2013, but is being opposed by the chemical industry who say there is an insufficiency of evidence. And I think it's still uh, being discussed in the European courts right now. But the, some of, quite a bit of the damage uh, to the bees and some of the damage to the honey production that they were losing has improved since the ban in France. So it is, and, and since then, 1999, 2004, the evidence suggesting that pesticides are playing one role in a multi-causal issue. There are many causes of damage to bees, from climate change to habitat change and so on. So pesticides is just one of many causes, as it was, as air pollution was with forest death in Germany. But it is always important to be able to take out at least those causes in a multi-causal mess that you can take out most easily. And the pesticides uh, is one of those. The evidence about that link has got stronger since then. Another good example uh, of using the PP was when, by accident, people discovered that if you put small amounts of antibiotics into animal feed, for some reason the pigs and the cattle and the sheep, they grow faster and fatter and faster. Great profits for the farmers, good news for the pharmaceutical industry. But as early as 1965, a top committee in the UK where this practice began said, this is not a good idea. Feeding um, tiny amounts of antibiotics into the population through animal feed and animals and us eating the animals is not a good idea because antibiotic resistance is already beginning to increase and there are much more intelligent 
better farming ways of making animals grow fat rather than fixing them with a dose of antibiotics. Um, that early warning was largely ignored because the power of the pharmaceutical companies and the farmers was too great until 1985 when Sweden just decided to ban antibiotics in animal feed, a decision driven by small farmers and consumer groups. Then Sweden joined Europe in 1995, and Europe said, you must reintroduce antibiotics into the animal feed chain, because you are now part of the free market of Europe. Sweden thought that's not a good idea, and they spent the next four years convincing the rest of Europe that they were right. And on the stroke of midnight 1999, Europe said, Sweden, you're right, we are going to ban these substances also. Pfizer, the multinational pharmaceutical company, didn't agree and took the commission to the European Court of Justice. And there, the judgment turned a lot around the precautionary principle, where the judges said, essentially, this is what the PP is meant to do. It, it is meant to give um, legal and administrative justification for decision makers to take action where we don't know all the answers. In fact, they spelled out the scientific knowledge that would be needed to fill all the knowledge gaps in what was a 17-step causal chain between a pig eating animal feed with antibiotics and you lying in hospital in 20 years' time resistant to the antibiotics that the hospital wants to give you. They said it would take decades to fill that knowledge gap. Meanwhile, we should just do the obvious thing and ban antibiotics. So that was another good example of the use. However, uh, and before I leave that, it's worth mentioning this positive point that I think Domingo touched upon, which is that when you use the PP, you actually stimulate innovation, mainly because you say to people, do things in a more intelligent way. Use a better approach. Think what you're trying to do and think of a better way. So with any environmental regulation or tax that follows the decision to take action on a, an agent, um, something that's causing damage, uh, those regulations and taxes, we know from 25 years of study by uh, MIT and uh, Harvard Business School and the OECD and the EEA, they always stimulate innovation. So the earlier that you take action using the PP, the earlier you create innovation. And you also create markets, of course, for those innovations to come through. Um, a, a report just out a year or so ago looked at the whole question of 30 years of EU regulation. Does it stifle or stimulate innovation? It quite clearly stimulates innovation, as do taxes, as reports from the OECD and the EA illustrate. Now, some examples of the costs of not using the PP. I'll just briefly go through four, four or five of these. Firstly, asbestos. The very clear early warning was in 1898, where this lady inspector in the UK said, I can see in my microscope these particles. They will do damage, as you might expect. And of course, we did expect. The first human case followed a year later, 1899. Um, and the first epidemiology, a big study of all asbestos workers, was in 1906 in France, where they quite clearly found excess of what was then asbestosis, a kind of dust clogging of the lungs. Uh, very damaging, very painful, and very harmful. And they recommended then, in that French paper, action to reduce asbestos dust. Essentially, not much happened from then until the late, the mid 80s and the 90s, when gradually countries began to restrict asbestos, and finally the EU ban came in in about 100 years after the early warning. Because asbestos takes a long time to cause its damage, we've learned during the process uh, what. Um, <coughs> what happens. Essentially, the, 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 the bar charts are showing you uh, asbestos use, and the red dotted lines are showing you disease. And you'll notice that we're not yet at the height of the disease. The numbers of mesothelioma, which is the most awful cancer caused by asbestos, are still rising in the UK and in many countries. And that gives us another illustration 
from most of the case studies, which is when we look at a harmful agent at the beginning of its history, as with asbestos, we look at the first harm that we see, asbestosis, not a cancer. But then, uh, some 30, 40 years later, we discover it causes lung cancer in the 50s, 1950s. And then in the 60s, we discovered it causes, mes causes mesothelioma. In other words, the harm, and this is a general point from all the case studies, if you let something out in sufficient quantities and it persists, doesn't disappear, and you research it and monitor it, always the harm expands beyond what you first thought you had a problem with to much broader things. So tobacco goes from lung cancer to 10 cancers and heart disease. And uh, PCB goes from damage to wildlife to damage to children, brain damage in children. Lead goes from um, early lead poisoning of workers and then damage to the IQ of children and then heart disease in adults. So knowing that harm expands, the exposures also expand from factories to users to families to next generations to consumers. And the level at which the harm is known to cause damage always comes down. So we have a safe limit for asbestos or lead here. And then 10 years later, it's here. And then it's here. And then it's, there is no known safe level for lead or asbestos or any cancer. So the level at which harm is done also comes down. Uh, the economic costs, leaving aside the human costs, are huge. In the case of asbestos, it was um, 400 billion euro for Europe just in terms of the cancers alone, not the billions being spent on asbestos removal and the collapse of Lloyd's insurance. Yes, and a billion, a billion is 1,000 million uh, in your terms here, yeah. yes. Um, leaded petrol, to give one more example, and then I think I'll stop because uh, there's a lot more to share with you and I feel that maybe we could get some discussion going just based on the examples I've shown so far. But with leaded petrol, when back in 1925, uh, GM and Standard Oil decided to put a tiny amount of uh, lead into petrol to make the engine work better, the professors of the day said, this is a stupid idea. It will escape into the streets. It will be breathed in, probably by susceptible subgroups like children, and it will do damage, as Professor Henderson quite clearly said. It will be in nearly universal use before the public and the politicians wake up, and then it will be too late. We will have damaged the brains of children many generations. And that's what happened. After they allowed it onto the market in 25, it became a global product around the whole world. And it took another 50 or 60 years before we managed to realize that he was right and to restrict the, um, um, the, the, the lead in petrol, causing huge losses economically. Because if you reduce people's IQ, they on average have less earnings, less productivity, so you have a huge societal cost of uh, brain damage to children. At the time, in 1925, there was an alternative which was putting some alcohol inside the petrol. Technically, it was actually as good or better. The inventor of the lead drove a car based on it to some engineering uh, conference and said, this is brilliant. That was 1925. Then they realized, anybody can make alcohol. Uh, whereas if we keep control via the oil industry, then we keep all of the profits. So they closed down that innovation pathway to the future with lead, with uh, alcohol, and just used lead instead at great cost. I think I've got some costs here somewhere. Uh, oh, <laughs> this is also an important point. At the same time that the professor was saying that it is going to be hazardous, the industry was replying to the US Surgeon General and saying, um, we've thought about this a lot, given it serious consideration. We haven't actually done any research, but we are convinced that the average street will not be hazardous. That you see uh, throughout many of the case studies, a very strong initial assertion of safety without any evidence. Um, and leaving it to the public and to victims and researchers and Vivo Sanos and the NGO to prove that something is hazardous. 
Um, and the cost of inaction, as I mentioned, uh, the economists working for us at the agency in the chapter in here called Costs of Inaction, where we look at the economic costs of those things that we know about, um, some 4 to 6% of GDP is the estimated cost of the loss of output from brain damaged children over several decades. So an expensive mistake. And then perhaps the last example I'll use before just stopping in the middle of the slides, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, in the tobacco industry story, which begins in 1955, more about, about that time, early 50s, when the first very convincing study was done of British doctors, lung cancer, smoking, the tobacco industry uh, said to itself, what we must do, we must find scientists who will put doubt in the minds of the public and policymakers. Uh, we will interfere with the science. We will raise false questions. We will try and make the science look uncertain, manufacturing doubt. And that tactic worked and was very successful for the tobacco industry for about 30 or 40 years. It was also used by lead. It is still being used by the fossil fuel industry in the climate change issue. Um, and is something that uh, politicians need to be aware of. A key question to ask is, who financed this research? Because you can see where it is done by interested parties who have an economic stake in the matter, then it is always biased towards their interests. Um, I'll skip the CFCs one, I think, except to say, when we did finally take action on CFCs, and we avoided some 20 million skin cancers and some 130 million cataract cases, some of those are occurring because we acted too late, but we did save some of them, a lot of them, by acting in 1987, some uh, 13 years after the big early warning. But we have then discovered that because CFCs are greenhouse gases, we have saved a lot of pressure on climate change by removing that source of greenhouse gases. This was a secondary benefit of action that we didn't foresee at the time. I'll finish on this one because it just illustrates how long we have kind of known about climate change. A Swedish scientist in 1896 said basic physics tells us if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere high up, it will increase the average temperature of the globe by about four or five degrees C. That's pr approximately the, the, the best guess of scientists currently. And it, as you can see from that slide, it has been repeatedly observed ever since. It is only now, I think, that uh, we are taking, or hopefully from Paris, that we are beginning to take serious steps uh, to deal with climate change. Uh, though some countries are ahead of the others and some companies are doing great things. But the time when we could have used the precautionary principle on climate change disappeared probably around about 1960. It was, it was pretty obvious then, at the latest, that action should have been taken. So perhaps we, I should stop now and invite discussion and questions about the issues that lie behind um, the, the difficulties and the opportunities of using the precautionary principle, both to continue to maximize innovation, but to minimize harm to people and to environments. And thank you for your patience uh, in listening.